Yeah, I, I just want to read a quick excerpt from, from your piece that I thought was just so on point and so powerful. And I'm hoping you can kind of elaborate on it now, three years later, um, you know, in the context of, you know, the Goya boycott and some of the stuff that we're seeing on Twitter. You said um, in regard to uh, the left, they tend to... Uh, you know, be about language, individual identity, body language, consumption habits, and the like. This is a natural consequence of a left that's in fact small groups of people in middle class settings who have no organic way of getting trained in class politics. I thought that, that was so on point. And so um, can you elaborate on that a little more? Yeah. Universities have always been a recruitment ground for socialist parties and communists. The difference between our time today and the earlier times is this. The earlier times, you would have the student wings of, say, communist parties, the student wings of socialist parties. And the idea was you bring them in, and then you send them out. You bring them into the student wing of the party. They become members of the party. My wife, Nivedita, was like that. She, she became a, a, in Delhi in college. She was the vice president of her college on a communist ticket. You came into the party, they socialized you, and then they sent you out to do actual organizing. That is the actual school of politics. And for middle class people, it's essential because that's where you see a lot of your conceptions about what social priorities ought to be, how to articulate social demands, how to understand people's consciousness in the working class, consciousness which you know initially you may not be very happy with, but and above all, how to make yourself relevant to them. That's where you learn it can't learn it simply in a seminar room or in a camp. What's happened now is because by the 80s, the institutional links that could have connected students and upwardly mobile professionals who were trying to commit sort of class suicide, the institutional and organizational links that could have provided a conveyor belt from the university into those settings, that was destroyed. So they were literally on this class island. Once that happens, well, what is it that you try to do? First of all, you're no longer in the position as you were in the 50s and 60s of actually initiating class rebellions, class organizing. You can't initiate it because you're in a very weird institutional setting. So the first thing that happens is you have to piggyback on other people's organizing events. You can have campus protests, you can have campus meetings, but to go outside the campus, you have to kind of rely on what other people are doing. So the left becomes more of a spectator that is now sort of uh, free riding on actual organizing efforts. It can't do a lot of organizing itself. The second thing that happens, of course, is you turn your attention to whatever, A, you're experiencing the most. Because remember, you're trying to recruit people. How are you going to recruit them? You're going to say, hey, are you angry? Are you unhappy? Are you pissed off? Are you treated badly? Come to our organization. We'll help you change the world. Come in and they say, well, what is it that's pissing me off? It's how I'm treated in my class setting. It's how my upward mobility is frustrated because of sexism or racism or something like that. So not only do you lose the ability to organize the class, not only do you start focusing on symbolic things, because that's all you can really focus on, something much more pernicious happens. The way you understand racial oppression, the way you understand gender oppression also changes. Racial oppression now becomes racism as middle class people feel. Gender oppression also undergoes the same change. So the very program that would excite you and the, you, the prism through which you're looking out, even at what we call, sorry, what we call identity politics, that changes too. It becomes a lot narrower. And the roots of that go back to this profound epochal victory in the 80s when non-campus, non-university working class organizations were destroyed once, hopefully not once and for all, but for the long term, it's been two gen three generations out. We don't see any way out of it right now. Yeah, and this, this brings us, us to an, a really important distinction that actually I think is very reflective in your piece as well. One of the things that's so disturbing to me about the, I mean, you know, I critique the identitarian frame and all the woke stuff and the, you know, just the, the, all the toxicity and moralism and bad politics, which, you know, you're alluding to where it comes from structurally. But it's, it's very important because I want to be clear when you're talking about non-discrimination. One of the things that's most disturbing right now to me is that there is a sort of edge of culturalist politics that their discussions are all on sort of 
monitoring various personal moralities or how things show up in the corporate setting, even as there actually is a systemic uh, right-wing attempt in the formal sense. You know, the Roberts Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in 2013. I mean, the, the, the substantive rights that are absolutely non-negotiable or you literally have an apartheid state are actually under siege. And somehow in the middle of this sort of obsession with very specific class positions and kind of like prescriptive moralisms, you're losing the other side of the equation, which is that substantively there actually is a serious problem. And that to me also leads to, you know, some who identify as the sort of socialist left being really flippant about like, oh, well, that's bourgeois values. Well, yeah, <laughs> right. That's part of the myth. Yeah. Interesting thing about bourgeois values. I really believe that we talked about this once before, Michael. Um, but let me deepen it a little bit more. What we call bourgeois liberal values were won by working people. They weren't won by the middle class. They weren't won by elites. They were so the right to vote, the right to uh, the anti discrimination laws that you see, the civil rights movement was fundamentally rooted in working class black communities sharecropper struggle. It wasn't, in fact, the, 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 the movement came to an end when it went beyond just formal liberal rights and started moving towards economic rights, not just because that's the moment when American capitalists said, ah, okay, you've gone far enough, we'll give you your rights, but you can't have the other stuff. It's also because that's when the black middle class started losing interest in it as well. The, the, the fact about liberal culture is this, what we call liberal culture and many leftists disparage as merely bourgeois, merely uh, 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 rights-based, that liberal culture was in place and flourished as long as labor was able to give it some sort of muscle and support. Once you take away the labor movement, and the, the reason it matters is that it's the only real force that is a counterweight to the power, the structural power of capital. Once you take away the power and the counterweight of that movement, all you've got left in society, power-wise, is the power of people who hate democratic rights. That's the economic elite, that's capitalism. Once their hatred of democratic rights has no organized opposition to it, you're gonna see the culture of rights also start to dissipate. Not just a socialist movement dissipating, the crux, the essence, what is valuable in liberal bourgeois culture also starts to degenerate. It's, there's two sources for this. One is, as we see in the US, capitalists and their legal and their ideological and political um, uh, uh, servants launch a direct attack on it through the court, through legislation, et cetera. Et cetera. But the second is, once you take people's social supports away from them in the form of pensions, of unions, wages, benefits, housing, childcare, it becomes a Hobbesian world. It's a world of all against all. It's a world in which it's every man for himself. The only social support you have now is your kith and your kin, which ends up strengthening ethnic, racial identities, etc. And you get a balkanization and tribalization of society rather than the collective solidarities that even a welfare state start, uh, is able to support. Forget about socialism. One of the great things about a welfare state is because it's universalistic, people feel they have a common stake in things. That's no longer the case. That, of course, is going to corrode a liberal culture. It's, of course, going to corrode a culture of mutual respect and valuation. So now you've got a pincer movement. From top, the elites are taking away even the formal rights you have. At the bottom, people are so busy scrambling to sustain themselves, seeing everybody else as a potential competitor, seeing everybody else as a potential rival, that it corrodes the cultural and normative basis for liberal culture as well. So for those socialists who say, oh, this is just merely bourgeois rights, understand something. Those bourgeois rights were won by working people. And the ev evisceration of those rights also has to do with the evisceration of working people's organization. So even if you're a liberal, even if you see yourself as somebody that who simply reads, you know, Vox every day or something like that, you have a direct interest in supporting the labor movement.